Hey everyone, Kyle Hamrick here for School of Motion. Thank you so much for joining us today for our second episode of Spotlight, where we talk with people from around the motion design industry about their work and their lives and whatever else comes up. Um, I'm really, really excited to have today's guest with us. Um, he is a designer and uh, creative director and design thinker, and uh, he is an instructor for a couple of our courses. And honestly, he's probably the primary reason why my work looks way, way, way better than it used to. Um, please give a good School of Motion welcome to Mike Frederick. How you doing, Mike? Hello, Kyle, and hello, people of School of Motion. How's it Yay. going? And hello, Headmaster Cornman. I know you're listening. <laughs> he is indeed. I saw him lurking in the chat. Good. Uh, Mike, I see you're repping School of Motion on your shirt today. Yes. Nice. The three triangles and some other stuff. I'm not sure. <laughs> I like it, though. Well, we're, we're going to be talking all about like abstract things representing other things today. So it's very That's appropriate, right. right? That's right. We're going to talk about viewfinders, right? We're going to be cropping. We're going to be talking about abstraction, simplification, positive like and it. negative space relationships, figure grounds, figure ground reversals, fun stuff. It's not, You're stuff already that, blowing my mind. Yeah, stuff we all want to know about on a Friday. <laughs> uh, you know, we've also been hyping this special guest, and I think someone in the chat was thinking the silhouette looked a little bit familiar. So uh, I guess we'll see whether they're right or not. Uh, we have our creative director, Mr. Ryan Summers. Hello. Hello, world. Hello, Michael. Hello, hello, hello. How are we going? <laughs> I thought it was probably a good idea to bring someone in who actually knew about all the stuff Mike was talking about, because uh, I am not a designer, and I feel like all I could do is just kind of sit here and look pretty. Um, so hopefully Ryan can uh, help uh, help keep everything rolling along there. Uh, my dirty little secret is I bow down to, to Mike. I, I actually was in, I think, the first audit of the design boot camp because I thought I knew design until I actually took his class, and I realize how much I had to learn. So I'm here to learn as much as I, I can as well. Observations. Awesome. Yes, that's all we need to do is observe, observe life around us. And as all of you may have observed, obviously, this is a live stream, uh, which means that you can ask us questions in the chat and we will do our best to answer as many as we can. Um, we, I have a feeling we could probably talk about this stuff for like three hours uh, without <laughs> trying too hard. Uh, we're going to try to keep it to an hour today. But if you have questions, please uh, drop those in the chat. Uh, we've got Frank and Ella with us today um, that will be uh, you know, addressing some of them in there and also uh, putting those questions in here so that we can see them and uh, try to answer them for you. So uh, yeah, we're really excited to, to get into the, this today. But first, I wanted to, um, you know, most of our guests, we make them do their own bio, but Mike is just so awesome. I'm going to read his bio for him. Um, Please. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Mike, you can tell me if I get anything wrong here, right? Sure, so, yeah. Uh, sure. <clears throat> Mike is a painter, designer, art director, creative director, and design thinker. He grew up outside Atlanta, studied at Ringling College of Art and Design, and is now based in Boston. Mike's been rocking Photoshop and designing for motion since pretty much base of the... Yeah, basically, <laughs> since both of those became a thing. That's the Stone Age. 30, it is. <laughs> With over 30 years experience and multiple Emmy awards, I think I spy a couple of them in the background there. Uh, he also noticed that his wife had a few more than him. Yes. It's probably yes. safe to say yes. that Mike yes. Yes. knows what he's doing. Uh, he worked with some guy named Joey something, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, in Boston and yeah. became co-creative director at a studio called Toil. That Joey guy was starting some After Effects tutorial website, I don't know, and was pretty persistent about getting Mike to create a design class for it. Uh, he's now been creative director at his own company, Frederick Creative, for eight years, and is also instructor for School of Motion's Design Bootcamp and now Design Kickstart. Mike has worked with some pretty small-time brands like HBO, FX, Microsoft, Showtime, Subway, McDonald's, Vice Media, Fox, a &E, PBS, Harvard University, MasterCard, Discovery, and perhaps most importantly for a now Bostonian, Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, Mike, it, it's an absolute yeah. honor and pleasure to have you with us here today. So oh, thanks so much. Please. No, no, it's a pleasure to be here. And I just want to say to all the School of Motion alumni, you're the best people, you're the most talented. We just need to say that. Okay, done. <laughs> it's not about me, it's about all of you. Agreed. And uh, we are going to be dropping some serious knowledge on him today. So uh, I, I, I think this is going to be a really great stream. I'm excited for it. I'm excited about Design Kickstart. I am too. Uh, honestly, I've just seen a little bit of it because I've been busy with other things. Um, and I know one of our uh, one of our other team members, Frank, who's with us in the chat, told me the other day um, he's been watching through it 
in, in preparation here. And he said it might actually be the best school of motion course that he's seen so far. I paid I him. You know, I paid course. Frank. I paid him a lot of money <laughs> and good good for you, Frank. He's paying more in, in the lies, I know. <laughs> yeah, no, it took us uh, three years to make this course. I mean, we did tons and tons of research. I mean, three years of researching. Uh, we did uh, lots of observations and we basically wanted to look around our industry, which is motion, mm -hmm. right? And we wanted to find where design and motion theory, where they aligned. And we started to notice, especially online, all the sources had design siloed over here and motion over here. And there was mm -hmm. this huge gap. And that's the way it has been going for probably 30 years, right? It's been this gap between you're either great at design or you're great at animation. And there's kind of like no life in between. But now our clients all want us to be great at everything. And it's really hard some, sometimes to, to do that. And realistically, it is really hard to do that. So we created this course because we wanted to basically create a single theory entity that would contain design knowledge and motion knowledge for people like us, because we're a motion audience. And so that's, that's really why it took so long to make the course is because we had to really dive deep into what was available and a lot of the design theory has been living longer than motion theory. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that exists in a vacuum of static, like print stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we needed to migrate all of that information about positive and negative space relationships, abstract thinking, simplification into motion because it's different. Because when we start moving cameras, it changes everything. And so you know, motion for design or design for motion is is a lot different because it's always changing. And if we can understand that when we move the camera, we we create implied motion through static frames, and we have to do that across multiple frames. And that's why I don't think a lot of people talk about design for motion because you got to like show like twenty frames of something implying movement. And that's really difficult, especially when you're dealing with positive and negative space relationships that really rely on whether you're seen symmetrically or asymmetrically. Mm -hmm. And all those things in combination create positive and negative space eye moves, which are passive or active. And those kind of spaces, you combine them together and you create pace. So we need to understand how all that works from a fundamental sense. And that involves contrast, proximity, figure ground, um, harmony, uh, let's see, rhythm. I mean, Ryan, throw out a few more design principles. I mean, <laughs> we, I mean there's tons, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I've taken this class or been through all the content three times already. And it, it is what Mike's saying, it's very unique in the sense that it's almost a cinematography for designers course because almost every other place I've looked at that teaches design, like Mike was saying, it's that you learn design, you learn all the principles while you're also learning a bunch of animation stuff and they feel totally unrelated. And then it's almost up to you to synthesize right. the two, like put those learnings together. But this is really design for motion people. Um, the one, the other really big thing that I think is awesome about it is that I, we don't say this like on the tin, but the question I get more than anything all the time, whenever I ask like, what would you love to see a class about? It's how do I do transitions? It's always like, how do I make that transition? How do I do what Buck's done or Oddfellas or whatever? Like, how do I come up with it? Like I know how to animate it, but how do I come up with it? And out of all of our classes, this is the class that I think does it the best because it really does talk about how to plan it. Almost like, um, I think we said this before, like a lot of people who are motion designers that use design, they're basically interior decorators. They basically throw a lot of glitter and flash at a screen and that works sometimes, but very few are actually architects. Very few actually know That's the right. underpinnings that you can put anything on top of. And when you're talking about a transition, going from a design frame to a wholly different design frame, that is really the magic is understanding that those underpinnings. Mike goes through the theory of it, but the cool thing is you actually, in a very simple, easy way, easy to follow way, go through two or three of these, I think, in the actual exercises of how do you go from this beginning to this end and show how to think about it. And it is really yep. just rooted in design principles. Yep, it's, it's really, when you start to break it down into the fundamental DNA, the DNA of everything we do as visual people is based on your relationship with positive and negative space and how you arrange it. And that's it. Like everything we're talking 2d, 3d, 
um, cinematography, we're talking uh, editing, we're talking uh, uh, you know special effects, we're talking everything is based on perception of positive and negative space. And so we literally start there. I mean, in the orientation class, we, we, we talk about observation first, right? You have to see the world like a designer of motion. So we start talking about the fundamentals of seeing. How do you see? Because everybody, like everybody we interviewed in this course, all the spectacular designers, that was the last thing I would ask them is, how do you see the world? And they gave us these wildly different answers, but it's unique to them. But the way that we tend to see from a fundamental place is we do tend to see either symmetry or asymmetry. And so when you start there, you can start to break down different kinds of compositions based on proportion, because proportion is the one thing we do talk about in this class. Proportion drives composition, because if you think about proportion, it is basically using a, the design principle of contrast. To make something big, you look at it, make something small, it's not as important. So those really simple things, if you really look at complex work by really complex people and you go, I'll never do that. But if you really look at their frames, it's really based on these underlying um, fundamentals. And then, they, then because of their uniqueness, because we each have a un unique way of seeing, they put their unique spin into the fundamental. So it's like, like you know, Ryan was saying, glitter and you jazz up something, that's what we do from a unique standpoint, but underneath all, all of that paint is a very uh, fundamental place. And so that's really where we start with this course is talking about observations. We talk about simplifications. We talk about croppings, right? Like croppings is one of those things where when you have a viewfinder, you start to see the world in a different way. Viewfinders have been used you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years in painting, it's been used in photography. It's a, it's just a way of cropping what you see in front of you to make new relationships. Because it's, that's really it's also what a great way to let people know that you're a very professional cinematographer. If that's you right. That's right. Right. That's right. I walk around with this like tied to my, you know, <laughs> my chest, and I'm just like, what? But uh, yeah. So in in orientation, we really start to talk about these kinds of abstract sort of. Um, ways of seeing because when you start to look back in history, you start to see abstract art from the 20th, you know, like mid 20th century, you start to look at these art movements and you can go all the way back to cave painting practically and pottery. You can start to see how human beings see. You can start to see repetition pattern. You can start to see positive and negative space distribution way back, you know, 20,000 years ago. And then if you go up to like 20th century uh, abstract art, abstract expressionism, you can start to see how people started to abstract positive and negative space. And if you look at modern day motion design, you can start to see the similarities in between something that was done 100 years ago. And it looks almost the same because you're using the same fundamental. So those are the things we're, we're talking about in this course. And so it's, it could sound deep to a lot of people, but really once you practice in repetition all all of these things is not that hard and we have some examples i don't know when you want to show those Kyle. we do yeah but, I was, but I there's was like waiting for you to stop blowing my mind for a second no, no yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so i mean Super honestly slides. i probably should have planned to just replace myself with that head explode emoji here um but uh I know that we have some some great examples prepared for people, uh, you know, dummies like me who maybe um, aren't up to speed on some of the things you're talking about. Uh, I really love this example. Um, I know we have this first one, uh, which is who should take this course. Do you want to do that before the example? Oh, yeah. Okay. So so that? let's say all right. So let's say you're at home or you're you know you're out and about and you're thinking, why should I take Design Kickstart? Mm -hmm. Because maybe I've taken other design courses and I know what I'm doing, and that's great. So maybe yeah, if you're if you're a really skilled individual that's been doing it for thirty you know years, you probably don't need to take this course. Or if you're teaching this kind of stuff already, then yeah, sure, mm -hmm. don't take it. But let's say you're a uh, someone that's working in a completely different industry. So let's say you're a biological engineer, and for some reason you want to give up the fame and the fortune of doing that, whatever that is. And and I don't I don't know what that is. But anyway, let's say you're doing something like that, and you want to dip your toe into what we do. 
Well, this would be a really great course for you because we do talk about learning to see the world like a designer. And if you know no nothing about that, you start to learn about how to see you know, positive and negative space relationships. You start to understand that your eye moves in active and passive manners, and you can start to predict how you how you design with those spaces, because that's really important is how to predict how to how to design the outcome of something. So let's say you're somebody that works in a completely different industry. This would be a great course for you. And let's say maybe you're a financial analyst, right? Like this guy. And he's got a big monitor already. He's got two of them. And he's got this sort of driftwood, driftwood desk set up. So that's really cool. So we all have that. So let's do. And he's got these charts. He needs to animate those charts anyway. So he, he wants to become one of us, which is cool. So if you're like this person, we start to talk about figure ground. Now, figure ground is one of these. Uh, it's like a gestalt sort of um, psychology sort of term. And it's about perception. And... A lot of motion people never talk about figure ground because I think it's it's such an old school sort of term that we don't know that we're maybe even using figure ground in our motion industry because we're just like moving a camera, right? Mm -hmm. But when you move a camera, things change. You dive into things. So what becomes or what is the positive space on the ground becomes, right, the background. Why? Because you're moving a camera right through the background. Why? Why can we do that? Because we're moving a camera and we can do that. But the print, but the principle of what you're seeing happen is very different. So somebody that knows nothing, nothing about what we do, they would learn something about figure ground and they could talk about it at parties and they could talk to their friends and they could sound really smart. So that's one. Very impressive. Exactly. So that's I see, one. I think I see myself in the next example, though. Exactly. So the next example is Kyle. Um, and um, Kyle, yeah, if you're if you're a great animator, let's say you're like this woman and you're an awesome animator and people love you and you're always booked and that's great. But let's say you're a freelancer and people are saying, guess what? We need you to animate. We need you to to design. We need you to be an art director. We need you to, to do really everything. You Then what do you do? Do you hire people to help you? Well, that's what some people do and that sometimes works, but sometimes when the budget's not there, you, you really got to do everything. Mm -hmm. So this course would be great for someone who's an animator who already knows a lot about motion, but they just want to really understand more about design because design really, I mean, we're talking motion design. So we really got to get these two things together. So this great animator can you know push around keyframes, but they also need to learn to push around positive and negative space. So this type of person would be great for this course. And then let's say you're you're like me, you know, you've been around for so long that you're just kicking around at some studio and you're like some big time art director or a creative director, but you're working at a studio and guess what? They need you to start to design your own boards because they can't afford to hire that freelancer because you know they're trying to save money, let's say. So let's say you're one of those people. You are you went to art school a long time ago, right? You went to art school and you were like drawing on, you know, paper and that's all you did. There were no computers, right? So let's say you're one of those people. Well, this course would be great because you get a refresher on all the things like the golden ratio and, you know, the rule, rule of thirds and designing, you know, um, with symmetry and asymmetry and talking about proportion and color and typography is an expressive form. You start to relearn these ideas, but you're putting them through the lens of motion design. So maybe you're one of those people. You just need a refresher because, you know, you need to, maybe you, you maybe you're an art director or a creative director and you need to speak to the people you work with more fluently, right? Because as motion designers, our native language is moving keyframes, but also implying motion through positive and negative space. So and that's, that's a great point. You, I, I know one of the things we were talking about before the show is one of the things this course is really going to do is help give you the language of, of those design concepts. Um, I, I, I'd love to go ahead and hop to this example that you have ready. Um, Cause this all, uh, I did not have a design background and a lot of these terms were things that I was not super comfortable with. Um, I, I really love this presentation you put together cause it's, it's such so, a great, I field, yeah, I field tested this like a year, about a year and a half ago with my buddy, Dave Dodge in Atlanta. I just wanted to sort of see what people 
in the wild, kind of what they knew. So, so this was something I, I, I rearranged the the design, but this is the actual object. So Ryan, what is like? Let's Ryan, let's say, all right, you're from like another solar system or something. You don't know what this okay. is. So if you if your native language was form, if your if your native language was a form language, and all you understood was form, what would like what would you see? You do the squint test at that point, right? Like you just start to see shapes, and if you can find texture, but circles, straight lines. And why do you see that? I would imagine mostly through contrast, right? Like that's the, those are the things that have the highest contrast, right? I don't see any logos. I don't see any kind of like surface level details. I just, if I yeah. squint my eyes, even those spokes, those lines in the spokes go away, right? But those really strong, the highest contrast, the biggest value changes right. are in those circles and those big, those big triangles. Okay. That's, that's good. So yeah, that, that, that's kind of what I think is you don't see a bike. Go ahead and, and you just tell me when, when to go through here, but. Oh yeah, yeah. So you don't see a bike here. You just see form. You see yeah. circles, straight lines, triangles, and you know, you just like you could turn this thing upside down and it wouldn't really matter. It's just form. Mm -hmm. So, so all right. So we this is not a bike. So go to the next frame. All right. So what visual skill should a designer of motion practice the most? That's kind of the that's like the first question we ask. Mm -hmm. It's like, what should you be doing? Like, why why are why are we here? Next. All right, visual observation. All right, so observation is one of those uh, things where when you slow down and you start to see, you start to see new abstract relationships, right? And you start to make like sort of discoveries in your brain because your eye is seeing form in a new way. It's seeing it as what it is, form, abstract language, form language. So visual observation is why we need to do that. But why do we really need to be really good at observing? Because observation leads to abstract visual thinking. Now, Ryan, when we start to abstract think, like what does that do to like form languages? Like when we start to abstract something, it, it turns into what? It just turns into just form, right? Yeah, it, it gives you the ground material to be able to combine anything with anything else, right? Like it lets you be able to create like new meaning out of common objects, which is why I love this example is that it shows very quickly once we get through it, how all you really need is like curiosity and a little bit of imagination and the ability exactly. to observe a big picture and separate it out. Right, right. So good. All right. So yeah, so abstract visual thinking leads to new visual discoveries because once we start to crop abstract it starts to look new. It starts to look like a new language. So, whoop. so this form, which we know is a bicycle because we live on planet Earth, but if we didn't, it would just be a bunch of stuff. So what is this thing? Yeah. So let's what look closely. Yeah, what do we see? So let's start right. breaking this down. All right, so it's basically a ring, a fat ring with these other spooky looking mm -hmm. lines. It's just lines and circles. Mm -hmm. We've got, and then we guy. got, yeah, we got more of these things. We got more lines and circles, and it's just, right? It's just visual language, all right. And then this is like these sort of rounded triangle-looking things with more circles. Mm -hmm. And this is just these big sort of triangular-looking lines. So this is the visual language of this thing that we're seeing, right? If we really break it down, so what can we do with this? All right, so abstract thinking leads to new visual connections and simplification. And this is what we talk about in orientation. This is this is it. This is what we're, we're talking about is mm -hmm. abstracting what we see to make new visual languages, which is how brands are built. So mm -hmm. new, new visual connections help designers create visual languages and boom. this. So we took the idea of a bicycle. We took the parts of it and we broke it into what it is which are lines, circles, and we just made something new. I'm not really inventing the language. I'm just moving it around and cropping things and just having fun. So I'm making new discoveries. Now, this looks like, you know, some sort of abstract art possibly, but it's all made from the elements of that bike. So the next frame, again, now look at your eye. Now this is really important for motion people. 
you're creating repetition of positive and negative space. Now there's a lot of negative space, the white space, the positive space is the black space. And look at how your eye moves to this image. It's like, duh, 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 right? It's like you're, you're moving through where the positive space is reacting to all that open space. But again, these are just elements of the bike repeated. So it feels like, it doesn't feel like a bicycle. It just feels like shapes. And it's like, my eye is moving through this. It's, it's interesting. And it's, and it's cropped. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven vertical crops. All right, the next frame. Now look at this. Look at how your eye is moving through this very small amount of positive space, right? The positive space is moving in a certain way. And the negative space, which is all this white space, is breaking up how our eye is moving through the center of the frame. So that's kind of interesting how just by cropping these lines, it, it allows us to sort of see this as not only abstract art, but it also allows our eye to move. Mm -hmm. And now let's say you followed one of those lines from left to right and you, and you come across this huge amount of positive space, moves through the frame, right? It stops your eye. And then if we go to the next frame, now we, we jump cut, we cut and we see this is all symmetrically based and we have this sort of blooming out of these rings. So there's a lot of dominant positive space, whereas in the first frame, it was a lot of white space. So we're building up this momentum of pace by the distribution of positive and negative space. So now this is interesting. If we go to the next frame, we get to see a transition. So we just went through the center. If you go back to the next frame, Kyle, the, the one you the just went. Previous one? Yeah, previous, sorry. sorry. There you go. So if you go through the center of, of the circle, the dark space in the center of this frame, then basically we're creating a reversal sort of mm -hmm. thing because we're looking at figure ground reversal right now. And that's, and that's basically a jump cut. And we basically say the background is, is white here, but in the next frame, the background changes. And now we're focused on white shapes, which is the positive. So in this space, we're doing the same thing with the typography. We're cropping that typography to make it look different. So it's all abstract at this point, but I'm controlling your eye from the top left of the frame moving down to the lower right. Why? Because all that open negative space in the upper right is stopping you from going there, but you're, it's forcing you to the left. And that's important because I am directing your eye because I can, because that's what I do, right? Designers, like puppet master. We, we force your eye to see different things based on the positive and negative space. Mm -hmm. So the next frame, you got these, sort of like shafts of this sort of bright positive space coming out from the lower right. And just by cropping it, you're starting to sort of electrify that space by creating this motion. And that's really kind of interesting. So the control of where your eye looks is really interesting just by cropping these shapes. And then if we go to the next frame, now I'm, I'm giving the viewer more negative space, but I'm still cropping and creating abstract moments with the visual language of a bike. And then just by adding some sort of you know, logo, it, it feels like sort of a le legit kind of you know, product or commercial or a board. So now if we combine all of these together, Oh, there we go. Yeah, here, well, we, you want to talk through that for a second? Uh, well, basically what we just went through are you know, like new visual languages create these opportunities to see movement across time and space or space and time. And that's what we do as motion people. We're, mm -hmm. we're not just moving things around in a static one frame. We're going to move your eye through multiple frames. Think about a two minute explainer video. I mean, that could be 50 frames. I mean, you got to move a lot of crap around in 50 frames. I mean, it's a lot of stuff that you got to like think about, like, what am I doing here? And that's why really good designers can predict how to start it, where to go, what's in the middle, what happens, and then where you go from there. It's all predicted. And that's why... Yeah, assuming that you plan it out before you just start animating. Which that's is, right. Yeah, that's right. Important. So that's, that's why it takes, you know sometimes weeks to plan the design of, of a two minute video is because you've got to figure out like, where do we go from here to there? But it's not just where do we go, but what is it going to look like? And why are we moving all this stuff around? So anyway, let's look at this. Yeah. 
So here we go. So you can start to see the distribution of white and black space, which is positive and negative space. And you can start to see how the visual language of the bike turns into something new just by cropping. So you use the viewfinder here. Can we see this, Kyle? Oh, yeah. All right. So we see the viewfinder. For a second there. So this is basically what you do. You crop to create these new relationships. So if we go back to the board, so now we see what the croppings can achieve. And then if we add color to it, just like two colors, then you start to say, wow, this like feels like something. So this exercise is not just an exercise. It could actually be applied. Like I do this every day I design. This is how I design. I, I really look closely and observe what I'm dealing with. And I'd say, well, what can I do to this thing to make it different or unique? So a lot of times this, this is what I'm doing. And, and if you go to the next slide, you know, you reverse the positive and the negative space. Now you get something completely new because if you switch, switch back between those two, Kyle. So from there to there, see, see how it feels different? Just by arranging the color and the positive and negative space, it's it's the dominance that's flipping. It's really interesting. So, um, yeah, this is just orientation. And orientations, I think the video, Ryan, didn't it run like two hours or three hours? <laughs> it was uh, comprehensive. <laughs> I, I feel like I just went to art school uh, already here. That that was, so, uh, I think a lot of people in the chat agree. <laughs> so. But you, you, you know, I think is the amazing thing about that is that, you know, their design seems very scary because from the surface, from the outside, it seems hyper complicated, right? But if you start just focusing on each one of these tools and applying them, like exercising the way Mike just did, you start realizing that you have these like very simple tools that when you stack them on top of each other and slightly adjust them from the outside, they look complicated, but it's very easy to go back and like adjust things and make changes. Like in that example, literally Mike is only using visual contrast and composition, right? There's only two of many tools that we have, but you can see how they're not that difficult to really start to play with. You may not fully understand them right away, but you can start playing with them and exercising them really, really easily. And that, that's what I love about this class. I think the biggest thing for me is that you learn the visual observation skills that even if you never really use them as a designer making frames, but you have to work with people, you understand why something resonates with you, right? Like why is a logo appealing to you? Or why is this one style frame out of the eight that you put together working? You can understand very easily when you know these design principles, right? Oh, you know what? This one works because it's laid out on thirds, or this one works because it comes right after a very like white positive space dominant frame. But then when we flip over, it just feels like it snaps. Mm -hmm. It's because you did a field reversal, right? You switched the figure ground relationship. If you know that, even if you don't feel comfortable saying it out loud, you can use those tools to just even help you pick out stock photos. Right. If all you ever do is just like put decks together and you're going through Unsplash or, you know, another place that has photos, you can actually elevate your skills just by knowing how to pick the right photo. Like, Mike, you've talked about that before, that sometimes your clients are like, how do you pick out the best photo from the same set of stuff we try to pick out? That's right. It's because you know design. You have the, yep. sens the sensibility of design. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, it takes hours and hours to pick. You know, you have to sift through thousands of photo photographs or ideas or whatever. I mean, that's just that's the process of anything, and creativity is no different. Um, it's, but you know, if you do go through the exercises of looking and observing, if you are stuck and your brain is just frozen and you can't get it to unfreeze, sometimes just by doing an exercise of observation will unstick it. And that's all you need. And for some people, that just like opens up a whole doorway, a whole universe of new tools and things to use to become creative. Because really, I don't really know what makes people like like so uniquely special and so you know just so talented that that we'll never ever be able to like us mortals. We will never get there on their level. Like. There's only a few people in the world like that. Most of us are just really competent and we use these skills and we use these tools and these principles to guide us. And then occasionally through your career, you're going to have a moment or two where something is like really clicking and you're going to like have a, a brain fart and you're going to say, oh my gosh, you know, this is like the greatest thing I've done in 10 years. And then you may have another 10 years where you're just like, ah, I'm making money. You know, who cares? But by... If you, but if you really start to observe things closely, it doesn't matter what you're making. A circle is a circle, a square is a square. If you're applying it to a really big brand, 
or a really small brand, does it really matter? It's it's all positive and negative space. And at I, the end of the day, I mean, that's that's the way I look at it. But yeah, um, I, uh, we 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 came up with a really great little line in our pre-show chat, which is design is at the root of every task that you'll be doing in motion design. And yeah. I think one thing that um, I'm probably not alone in this. I know that uh, a lot of the things that you did in that bike example, I have absolutely done those when making projects, but it was just like, well, I think it'd be cool if you went in the middle, but you're not making intentional choices about why you're doing those things. And right. I know that for myself, when I took design boot camp a couple years ago, um, it, it felt really uh, empowering because a bunch of stuff just clicked. Uh, like there were a lot of things that I had been doing, but just because like, I don't know, I think it looks cool and I'd seen other projects kind of do that, but I didn't know why those things worked or why I didn't have the language to even like have the conversation with myself, of why it was effective to be making those choices. Yeah. Um, and, and so th that's one thing that I, I think this is just going to be really powerful for a lot of people to be able to tap into that finally. Yeah, I, I really think design is the surest way to be able to work faster rather than harder. Like if you're putting together, if you've ever been asked to put together style frames, like for a pitch or something, and you put four frames together and one looks awesome, but you're like, why did the rest of them not look that good? And why did it take me so long to get these like average looking frames? It's probably because you don't have a lot of confidence in your design skills, right? Like Mike said, like being able to be predictable with your designs, it, it comes from knowing these individual tools, knowing how to stack them and being comfortable with experimenting once you have that kind of like comfort. Um, but it really does make a big difference. That's why sometimes you see somebody, they put three frames together in two hours when you're struggling to get one. You're like, how, where did that, where did that come from? That's, yeah. I don't know if we're showing this, but that's one of my favorite things about Mike's class is that he goes through this process, right? And he shows you how to lay everything out just in very simple skeleton structure kind of ways, right? Using black and white images, moving things around, scaling things up, scaling things down, field reversals. But then he shows how he puts the glitter and the jazz over the top of it. And all of a sudden, like, oh, that's where it clicks. That he doesn't start an octane and just move stuff around and hope it like hope it all creates flow. He builds the flow first. And then you can stack anything on top of it. You can do it. You can hand it off to someone. You can send it to a freelancer. But then you know everything works because it's rooted. And if the client comes back and says, you know what? That's two photo reels. Can we make it stylized? You're not throwing the boards away. You're just going back and changing the glitter or the camera that you've used or the lens that you've applied to it. And it, it really gives you a lot more confidence as somebody who's like trying to create something to win work. Yeah. So uh, I think we're also doing a lot of talking around like the importance of adding these skills to your repertoire, like mm -hmm. kind of depending on, you know, obviously people come to motion design from different, um, you know, different backgrounds. It's still a pretty young field. And, um, you know, not to be too ham handed here, but Ryan, I know you just put a course out that speaks mm -hmm. exactly to this point and the importance of it. Um, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I, not to sell it too hard, but level up a big part of what we talk about in it is trying to find out what your voice is, right? Like mm -hmm. there are a lot of people who are great at making things that someone else tells them like what to make, right? And they can execute on it, which is an amazing skill. But if you've ever struggled to figure out like what you want to create, what you want to talk about, what you want to be, if you're trying to specialize, like specializing doesn't just mean learning a tool. It can also mean specializing in your voice, specializing that you talk about something in a way no one else talks about, or you're obsessed about something and you're the person that I'm going to come and hire every single time. That's all rooted in design. Like uh, so many of us have gotten into motion design through technology and kind of done an end around design. And we're probably a little self-conscious. I know I am. When I took design boot camp, I was a little self-conscious of not knowing all the language, not knowing the words. Like I had a, like an intuitive sense of like why this logo is so much better than like another logo, but I couldn't tell you exactly why if I had to make it myself. Um, and that's what design boot camp helped with, but I really think that that's what design kickstart is built for. The bootcamp is very project based, but if you want to learn the language, if you want to understand the DNA, if you want to understand like why certain things you obsess with or love them, kickstart gives you those skills, I think. And then the great thing is, I think now we finally have this great vertical that if you're struggling with just getting into design because you're like, man, I don't know, Photoshop or like a lot of 3D people, you never spent a lot of time in Illustrator. Mm -hmm. PS, uh, Photoshop Illustrator Unleashed it does a great job giving you those tools, but it also lays the groundwork for your design skills as well. It's a great way where if you're like really scared of design, you're like, I don't know why I even need it. It's a great entry point. And then it works, it flows. The flow now from Photoshop Illustrator to Kickstart to Bootcamp is awesome. Mm -hmm. I will say 
if you like boot camp, but you want more exercise, or you really want to understand the individual tools themselves, individual things, Kickstart is actually a great place to fortify what you learn in the project sense. But if you felt like you were a little slow or some stuff didn't really click, like I think in boot camp we cover text incredibly well. Like the the amount of detail you go, Mike, into like kerning and tracking and individual letters, you know, being, you know, how to choose fonts. The rest of the design tools, I think Design Kickstart goes into that same level of detail and intricacy for the full spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's that's a great point, um, and I'm, I'm glad you spoke to that because I think we had a couple of people asking how how Kickstart compares to boot camp, and specifically maybe if you've taken boot camp already since that's existed, why would you want to come back and take Kickstart? It's not necessarily like the lesser course. It's no. Helping giving you that language. <laughs> yeah, well, it's harder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah design theory, like each, I think there's four, the first four lessons has like a 45 minute design theory video you have to watch. And then on the first day after, this is after like the three hour orientation video, the first lesson, there's two boards you have to, you got to make two boards plus watch the theory lesson. Yeah. So that's just day one. So you got to pump out two boards. Mm -hmm. Now they're black and white, but who cares? I mean, you're still, you still got to think about it. And then on, I think on like the Thursday, then you got two more boards on that day, plus the design theory video. And then the next week, I don't know if you, you get a break, probably not because you don't deserve one. You gotta, you gotta work hard. You gotta like do another board, mm -hmm. and another design theory. And then another design theory. It's just, Design theory is is just complicated only because once you understand the theory, that's one thing. That's the first thing. Second thing is to apply it mm -hmm. and to understand how to apply it because now you know the why. You're like, okay, I get the theory. Now I got to make something. And so it's like a double whammy. You could, you got to understand the theory and then make make something. That's why it takes you know thirty years to figure it out, is and you still don't figure it out. You just you just kind of keep going with it, right? So you, you're talking about applying it, and um, Ryan, you brought up Octane earlier, and uh, obviously two two D people are definitely guilty of this too. But um, you know we kind of talked about just throwing glitter on things, but I think a lot of times those of us that don't know a lot of, about these design principles, that's kind of our default. We just we find a way to make it look cool without really knowing why things look cool. But I, I think especially some of the more recent developments in 3D have made that even more of a thing. Like, well, we'll just render it with Octane. Sure, but you're not. Yeah, like, but you know, what there's, you're there's a lot of dead giveaways when that happens, right? Because if you can point out someone from their demo reel or their shorts or their personal work who don't have like a design background, even if they're 3D, because you look at someone and they do a title card, right? And the title card, there's two letters that are kerned awfully, right? Like they'll be super tight. And then the next set of letters will be super wide, but it's all one word and it almost makes it look like it's two separate words. Yeah. But they have all this amazing love that's been put into like the depth of field and the chromatic aberration and the texture and they pull stuff from substance and it, it's beautiful, but it's broken like from, from the outside or even something simple. Mike shows us all the time that, you know, a lot of people just put type if they're doing a title, right? They put type directly in the middle, right? But the problem is that makes it feel like it's falling down. Like it's almost always weighted a little low. And Mike just, it just is it's a simple yeah. thing. But if you just like punch it up by just a little bit, um, all those little tools that Michael shows of like, even like showing you how to create spacing by picking a certain letter and then you rotate that letter, the amount of spacing and use it as your vertical spacing. So you're building proportional relationships. These things sound difficult, but when you see Mike showing it in black and white in Photoshop, it applies to anything you'll ever use. And it's like I said, when you're a creative director looking to bring someone, it's a dead giveaway that someone actually doesn't know design or isn't taking the time to be like as kind of like attentive as they should be. That sounds really good coming out of your mouth, you know? <laughs> I practice. <laughs> I can't, yeah, that's, yeah, that sounds good. I'd take the course, yeah. You know, speaking of <laughs> things coming, uh, sounding good, I don't know, I, I'm that segue is not gonna end up working out. I don't know, uh, but so, we do obviously have some 3D courses as well. And uh, you know, much like you guys are way better equipped to talk about this, I feel like there might be someone who's better equipped Wait. to speak. Mm. Is there a mystery mystery guest? There's a second mystery guest. Uh, are you ready for that? And mm. I think if we all, uh, I, I'm actually not sure if there's a bit going on here, but I'm gonna do my own bit. And did you know that if you look into a camera lens and you say Hassenfratz, 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 you can make a wild EJ appear, or at least make a background appear. Ta da! I think we nailed it. <laughs> Excellent. Stuck the landing there, Kyle.
<laughs> that's that's my thing. Doing doing little shticks. Uh, that's the one thing I'm good at here. I think I hurt my back though. <laughs> so, uh, hey everybody. Hey, it's great to be on here. I've been snooping. I've been creeping behind the scenes. A lot of awesome design talk here. Well, that's the point, right? Yes, indeed. So but, I know that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh no, no, no! You do the thing. Oh well, I mean, my <laughs> thing was pretty much just going to be. Obviously, we've been talking about design and the importance of knowing it. Um, and obviously, you've got uh, now two uh, 3D courses uh, here on School of Motion. And um, it, you, as I was saying, you know, I, I think th there's a lot of tools in there that kind of make it easy to put glitter and you know shiny chrome on things. Uh, but if you don't know how to arrange the things in the first place, it uh, you know, it doesn't really matter, right? You're you're telling the story of my career early on. Like, Same. Uh, I think that's like the, you know, we we have this awesome curriculum, and like you said, I have now my second course coming out, which is you know my first course. If if no one's familiar with Cinema 4D Basecamp, we basically like, you've never gone in 3D before. Like just like design can be very intimidating, so can 3D. But I think it's it's that same thing where it's like if you just break down the fundamentals, like how does 3D work? Where are my axes? You know, which way am I moving these things? How does the software work? If you know just those things, it makes everything else you build upon it much easier. And same thing with design that you know Mike's been pointing out uh, to this point. Like if you just do these exercises. It, everything else makes sense. And I kind of relate it to like learning a, a new language where if you're just trying to grab different words here and there, but you don't know sentence structure, mm -hmm. uh, you don't know how the inflections of how sounds make, like you're just kind of, you're just, it's almost like watching tutorials, right? Like I'm learning how to say this sentence, but I don't know no, how to really it. speak the language. Yeah. yeah. So I think when you don't have a good design, uh, skill set. You don't know that visual language. You don't know how to animate either. And because this is what I see a lot, you don't have color theory. If you try to do stuff in 3D, like sure, you can learn 3D. Are you going to be making anything that's all that nice? Probably not. Because at the end of the day, like sure, I'm teaching you 3D, but there's only so much time to teach 3D, but then also design and then also color theory. So I think there there are some like shortcut hacks you can do. And I know watching Michael's course, I discovered coolers.co, which is amazing. And like all these different websites that uh, can create color swatches for you. There's an Adobe version now I th uh, or mm -hmm. that's been around for a while. And I think just that is like the bare minimum that you should be doing. And I just know for a fact that there's so few people that actually do that because yeah. just like Ryan was saying, there's dead giveaways. Like if you don't know color, but you just, you know, throw a, a light kit on there and you don't really know what's going on. You don't even know how to adjust things. Like, and I think Kyle, we were talking about this a few days ago where I don't know, is 3D the app with the most amount of very attractive crutches, you yeah. know, <laughs> like you have Octane and it's like, it's crazy because it does, like I put a sphere in the scene and it's like, damn, that's yeah, a sexy you know that's scene. Cool. I did nothing to the scene. <laughs> you know, you know I, EJ, it, it, tell me if you feel this way though. Like you're starting to see those dead giveaways, right? As more and more people use it, and more and more projects come out, and they get assigned to to like brands. Like you start, you can start pointing that stuff out, right? It's like you can see the environment fog. You can see where somebody's using a substance texture. You can see when somebody's pulled a shader from a company. Like it, it just feels like a lot of like shortcuts or or hacks stacked on top of each other and it's beautiful now but it's a lot just like comic books right like when you see a comic book artist who's awesome but three years later everybody's st stolen everything from that person's style and all of a sudden the original person their work looks way it looks diminished it doesn't look as special like i feel like that's where we're headed very quickly with 3d where a lot of the stuff that we're doing because it's close to photo real and there's a lot of like easy to grab things off the shelf they're just getting bolted together kind of haphazardly. And sometimes you, you can get something that looks good and it feels good, but it's just kind of like an accident, but it's not done. I think we said it earlier, Michael, um, it's not done with intent. It's not done with purpose. It's not done with vision. Like 
that's where all this stuff starts feeling. We use this term all the time. It starts feeling like an echo chamber, right? Like yeah. everything starts to look the same. It feels the same. And that gets really dangerous when you're working for brands who want to look different from each other, right? Like this car, car company A cannot look like car company B. And unless you actually know why things feel the way they do, you can't actually kind of create that, right? And I think another thing is with all the presets and you know materials you can download and everything, I think all of these presets, all of these crutches does so much to distance the artist away from the work so much. Like when you have all of these prefabricated things, you know, unless you're doing like, you know, uh, art deco to, or, you know, very abstract, you know, modern art or something like that, where, you, you know, Dadaism or something like that, like that's all prefabricated, but it's saying something, but you just said it, Dadaism. You guys can't say that. You're going to, you're going to, I can't, we got to show examples. <laughs> really, really. <laughs> well, I don't have any in my brain for that one. Uh, man Ray. Yeah, art, let's get Man Ray. Let's... You, know, you know what, though, I think is a really good example is if anybody's seen the more recent Microsoft stuff that's come out from their design group, you know, they're using the same tools as everybody, right? They're using yeah. the same 3D tools. They're using the same kind of filmic techniques. But because Ariel, is it, who, who is it that's actually, not Acosta, is actually kind of like the creative director pushing behind it. And he's pushing companies like Tendril and other, other vendors to, do things with a guided, intentful reason. That's coming from a designer, and all of a sudden, Microsoft looks like a totally different company that yeah. you would never have expected that sense of design sensibility or that it's sense crazy. of like warmth coming from such a cold, old company. That's because there's a designer. There's somebody who has a voice and a vision, and they understand the principles guiding everyone else. That's where you want to be at some point in your career as somebody who, if you're looking to become an art director or go beyond just getting assignments and fulfilling them, but adding something, that that's what something like Design Kickstart gets you on the path to being able to do. And then 20 years later, you get there. I mean, it's so difficult. It is our business. I, I think people underestimate how hard it is to do what we do. And I'm not just saying this just to blow hot air up everybody's ass, but I'm just saying it is like, you know, everybody listening, it's like, how many hours do you just sit around and think about this crap? I mean, it's, I mean, I've been doing this for over 31 years. It's just, it's like, it doesn't end. Yeah. But when you're feeling like when you're in your groove though, whatever your groove is and however you get there, when you're, when you're in that groove though, time just goes by and you yeah. just don't, and you don't even care. And that's why we're lucky because imagine working in an industry where you absolutely hate what you do. And we still can make money. Right. And that's another talk about. And, and we're lucky enough to, to protect ourselves. An industry where I think most of us love what we do. Yeah. Uh, and we're trying to always figure out how to be. Uh, obviously, it's, you know, competitive and it's easy to see all these people that are better than you. And you want to find these ways to make sure that you're doing interesting stuff. Um, yeah. And I think especially with people that are around the age of, you know, Ryan and EJ and myself, for a long time, it was it was totally fine to be very tools focused. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you could just be an After Effects guy or whatever, and you didn't need to know all this stuff. But uh, the industry's matured to the point where if you don't, you know, understand cinematic techniques and design techniques and um, some some editing, timing and pacing and, and all this kind of stuff like um, you do need to have this really good base of these things, because uh, otherwise you're probably going to, especially, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are, you know, maybe closer to our age who realize like, oh yeah, I yeah you know, haven't really been doing anything interesting lately, or I feel like I'm falling behind. And there's all these people that are about 10 years younger than me that are, you know, have been coming up and surpassing me because I didn't have that, that basis. Yeah. I mean, here, here, here's my pitch and it, I, I think we do a great job of it. I think we do it better than anybody else, but I, I, strongly urge anyone who's watching this who's like design why should i really do it i have so much other software to learn i need to learn real time houdini's coming up should i learn blender think of design as another piece of software think of it as another tool except once you learn it and you actually have confidence in it you never have to learn it again unlike any other piece of software every piece of software has to be rebuilt we learn we're going through it right now with cinema 4d in another two years it's going to be completely different than what you've spent the last 10 years using yeah. but if you know design it's just another piece of software it doesn't lay in one set of tools in your task bar but it, it's just another piece of technology but you own it and it can be your kind of gateway to personal expression. It can be your gateway to being able to work remotely as a designer and live anywhere you want, find any kind of work-life balance. If you're getting older and you're trying to figure out how to stay in the industry without having to 
carry this weight of I, I have to me stuff. I'm old yeah <laughs> <laughs> I just hire design, people <laughs> designs what allowed you to actually have this level of career at oh, this yeah. kind of level of stature and this type of work without having to also feel like you're carrying the burden of all my all my knowledge is about to go pouring out of me no yeah. longer be valid well I mean I'm a dinosaur when it comes to I've siloed myself so heavily in the design silo that I know literally very few of the software. I mean, I know that they exist. I know how to get a look. And that's important, understanding how to get a look from a piece of software, what software can get you something. So when you're finding references and you're finding the art direction that you need to make something look good, you know that you can actually do it. And I've actually done this. I've actually pulled stuff or I had an idea. And I'm like, can I, can I do a scatter effect with like, particles that do this and respond to this and people like, yeah, if you give me a million dollars and leave me alone for a year and I'm like, okay, that's not going to work then. So, you know, knowing all the software is great. And, um, and I think it, it is the wave of the future and it's going to go beyond because what I was doing when I was 21, 20 years old in this industry has completely like, it's totally changed. I mean, it's totally not there anymore. I mean, it is completely done, right? When I was 20 years old, whatever I was thinking, whatever whatever was cool back then and whatever the trend was, is totally dead. It is not even existing. But the one thing that does exist is how you think and see. And that's the one thing that will never change, as you said, Ryan, is that that is the one variable that we can be sure of, is that creativity comes from your brain and your, the way you see. And then the tools will be applied as needed. But... Um, yeah, you're going to have all this, like, you know, uh, in the in the coming years. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's just everybody needs to just know so much. And I and I don't know the the answer, of course, but I do know that by being as smart as possible about the way you see, then you can adapt to 3D, 2D cinematography, whatever, right? Music, you can just do whatever. You just have to be smart about the way you see your surroundings and your and your observations and make sure that you're using those fundamentals as as much as possible just because the fundamentals will get you out of a ton of shit it has gotten me out of so much stuff in my life um and you know and i and i stepped in lots of it and still do yeah. and uh don't ever talk to corman about that <laughs> and by the way speaking of corn man i mean I wonder, if, <laughs> wonder if he's actually um you know, I tried to teach him the fundamentals of design many moons ago, and I just don't know if he ever, if it really sank in. I don't, I don't know if it, I don't think it did, but he, he's, he's a lost cause there. But that guy, he's great. Yeah. <laughs> well, I will say, uh, I actually got a little bite-sized version of Design Bootcamp at a conference, which is where I first met Joey, which then led me to taking actual Design Bootcamp. So he picked up at least enough to get through like an hour of of a conference presentation. Yeah, but all the, all the School of Motion courses are great. I mean, every one yes. of them is um, hands down uh, comprehensive, um, and you learn so much stuff on every on every course. And uh, and it's it's such a good. I mean, the stuff we're teaching, you have to go to like some of the best art schools in the world to get this stuff. I mean, it's really hard to create the curriculum that we create just because there's so much density in what we're talking about, yeah. and it's and it's comp. It's multiple multiple levels of complexity that, um, and it's based on years of, of of just knowledge from everybody. But um, you know, like if I could draw like Sarah Beth, yeah, yeah, whatever, I'd be great, right? I mean, she's awesome. Like I, I can't do I can't do that, and I need to take her course. But you know, but three um, D, I'm not going to even go there. And uh, it's just looking at all you guys. I need a beard too. You guys all have. Beard. You do. You do. We <laughs> should have given you the memo. Yeah, See, but, I need a, but, but I need an Emmy, guys. I, everybody else has got an Emmy. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. That's right. That's right. I'll you trade mean. the beard for an Emmy. You want to send me one, Mike? <laughs> He's got pastures, I think. Yeah, my I'll talk to my wife. She's got more than I've got. Well, uh, yeah, my, it's yeah. Go ahead. I was gonna say you were just saying you're afraid of 3D. We had uh, B. Grandinetti who yeah. has never touched yeah. 3D before, but holy yeah. cow, she's, she's great at illustration, design, yeah, colors. Yep. She took the very first orientation lesson mm -hmm. and just blew it up, knocked it right That's, out of the park yeah, because yeah, no. that sounded really important. Yeah. You know, the yeah. software is way more easy to learn than design. You well, know, yeah. I have a I have a, a story that I always tell my my buddies just to really make them mad um, that are animators. 
I've only animated, I've used After Effects a couple of times and I only animated once in After Effects for a real project. And it was approved on the first pass and everybody was like, come on. I said, well, that's because I designed it and I, and I knew kind of how I wanted it to move and I could see all this. And they said, yeah, but, yep. com- but, but they said, yeah, but come on, you, you didn't even know how to set up a comp. And I said, no, I know. And I said, that's great, right? <laughs> I love the laugh, yeah. <laughs> and, they're, and, they're, and, they're, and I'm just like, ah. Isn't that the biggest truth of the industry is that even though it's called motion design and so many people focus on motion, that the amount of work it takes for for animation yeah. to make up for bad design compared to you can have the worst animation, but if the design is solid, you almost don't even need animation. You just need sound design and some good cutting. That's the thing that it's just like when you're putting together your own animated piece and you forget how important sound is. We all as as animators always forget how important sound is. It's oh, the yeah. same side with design, right? Like it's it's half of the job title, but so much of us so many of us either forget about it or we're intimidated about it, or we don't want to admit that like maybe we don't feel super confident with it. But man, like trying to animate a bad design and make it look good is maybe the worst assignment you can ever have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I that. will tell you that from uh, many years of personal <laughs> experience trying to do exactly that. <laughs> um, right. Fellas, uh, you know, I feel like, uh, like I said, we could probably do this for hours, but it's probably about time to start wrapping this up. Um, I do yeah. have a couple things that I want to say as part of the wrap up, and, and you all get to talk a little bit more as we do that. But um, I do want to remind everyone that uh, the courses for this fall session start on October 5th, which means that you have uh, less than, I don't know, 10 days to uh, to get registered if you uh, do want to join us this um, this coming session. So get on that. Uh, we do have Level Up that just came out. Uh, Ryan, if you want to say a couple more words about that, um, I did want to mo- note that it's a free course, uh, just kind of yeah. short, short one day thing. But. It's free, it's instantly available, and it's really built for anybody who's ever felt frustrated, whether you've been in the industry for a year or 10 years, trying to figure out where you want to go, why you want to go there, um, showing you all the possible avenues. We just released a, one podcast from it where we talked to seven or eight different people around the entire industry, just talking about where some safe harbors might be, where some of the new avenues might be. Um, but it's built for anybody that's ever really taken a school motion class and is ready to take their next step in motion design, but might really not know how to do it. We talk about demo reels, we cover imposter syndrome um, with an actual mental health expert, which is great. And we're starting to get some good feedback on that, but um, it's free, it's there for you. You can watch it as fast as you want. You can watch one one thing and then not look at it again for another month. But uh, yeah, it's been a big labor of love for me and uh, hopefully it's been helpful for people. Awesome. And then uh, EJ, you mentioned, um, obviously we have Cinema 4D Basecamp and then we have a new course that's just about to start this session, right? Yeah, so Cinema 4D Ascent builds off of Cinema 4D Basecamp where in Basecamp, it's basically like, hey, this is what 3D is all about. This is how to navigate around. This is how to use uh, and get familiar, build that muscle memory with how to work in 3D space because that's always a huge challenge, especially when you're just uh, coming from 2D. Uh, so that's kind of the, you know, getting people up and running, making their first 3D animations. That's Basecamp. Ascent, it's like, okay, you know 3D, you're going to learn all of these next level skills that are going to get you hired and be able to take on these, you know, more advanced kind of 3D projects. So we cover things like universal render concepts. And, you know, these are the type of things that like the things that apply to any software, like what are samples? How do you build up a texture from scratch? What are normal maps what are all these things doesn't matter if you're using cinema 4d or octane or redshift or arnold or unreal or whatever because it's all the same language so that's how we start out is teaching those universal render concepts showing them how they actually exist in this you know standard and physical renderer that's built into cinema 4d and kind of shows how how things were done like 10 15 years ago and how much things have changed but how all those things, if you did learn those old ways, how they apply now uh, to all these new renders. So we teach, you know, texturing and lighting using Redshift and Octane. We have guest appearances uh, by David Ariev, who comes in and shows some of his amazing Octane skills. We do uh, character, uh, like rigging for MoGraph. So if you've never rigged or animated a character before, like you're going to get your first experience in rigging concepts. And again, like, character uh or character animation uh boot camp that's the kinds of stuff like if you have all your fundamental skills like we're telling we're showing you how to how they can apply to uh all these different uh areas so uh modeling is something we cover pretty pretty heavily and that's always something that i love showing like if you just know a little bit of the fundamentals of modeling you can model 
most of what you ever need to model if you're in a MoGraph kind of setting. Um, we cover things like advanced MoGraph. So how, if you do know how to animate, how can you use these tools, not as a crutch, but to help you work smarter, not harder, okay? It's not a crutch. We're teaching you things that, you know, we, we're building on your, your core fundamentals. So uh, dynamics and things about dynamics that no one ever talks about. You know, it's these things where you just see something sexy on a tutorial and it's like, yeah, you know how to do that one thing, but how can you use it on a project that's like very heavily dynamics uh, focused? So all these very core uh, con uh, fundamental skills, uh, and, and not, not teaching button pushing. Like why, why would you need, like an example is maybe we don't need to do dynamics here. Maybe we need to hand keyframe that. Oh, you don't know how to animate? Like, okay, well, let me show you how to actually animate because you do need to know, you can't just use MoGraph and physics simulations uh, all the time, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I'm glad I did this in the order I did because you know you said several times about learning the fundamentals, and obviously we're giving people an impossible choice here. But um, you know, uh, explicitly the reason for talking to Mike today is to talk about how important it is to be learning design as a fundamental. So um, obviously we do have Photoshop and Illustrator Unleashed if you're still new to those design tools, and we have had Design Bootcamp, which is a very like project-based way to apply that stuff making boards. And then starting this session, we have Design Kickstart, which is obviously what we've been talking about uh, through most of this episode. Um, do, you, do you have anything else you wanna say uh, about it, Mike? That's a really awesome open though, I have to say. Alan did a really awesome job. I, he's such a talented guy. See, there's so much, there's so much talent in this world. I don't know if we all know this, and I'm sure we do, but man, there's just so many people. Like all the people that come through School of Motion courses, it's amazing what they do. I, I'm just saying, if, like I'm a big fan of everybody that comes through Design Bootcamp. I like get into the, the Facebook group and just tear it up as much as I can. But I tell you, it's it's amazing. I you know, like I don't even have the energy to be that amazing. It's like <laughs> it's like these people are. Everybody that comes through is just mind blowing. So our industry, it, it, it feels like the health of the industry is, is really, is really well, it really good. And I, and I think that for many years to come, it's going to be good. We just need to be smart about how we act as an industry. We need to protect ourselves and protect each other and, um, and make our creativity, you know, create our careers, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, that, that's all I can say. I don't, but yeah, design and 3D, it's all the same. In my in my in my book, it's all it's all visual language, it's all positive and negative space. It it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. It's just it's all good. Let's just all go to the mountaintop and you know and just kind of vegetate for a while and just kind of uh, <laughs> Awesome. That's, well, yeah, that's all I gotta say. Let's just be the guru, <laughs> the the gurus that we are and let's just guru it. Uh, so I do want to take a second and mention that next week I, uh, I'm going to be doing another live stream next Friday, one that I'm actually really excited about. Um, I'm going to have four of our alumni from all around the world. Um, yeah. Uh, we could be talking with them with uh, Saul, Noose, Mena, and Vishal. I actually saw Mena in the chat here. So hi, Mena. Um, and we're going to be talking about what it's like working in motion design in you know some of these other places. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, the you know America is not the only country no. and this is Wait, a worldwide what? industry. I know <laughs> it's tricky. It, um, yeah, it's amazing that the, yeah. just the talent, you know, that's all over the place. It's just, it's breathtaking. I don't know. I, I mean, <laughs> imposter syndrome, you know, I am, the, I am the name that comes up when it says that. I just it, like- I feel like all four of us I, could probably speak to that. I so another hour. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, yeah. We learn about imposter syndrome. Everybody I, gets, I, if somebody tells yeah. you that they don't, they're lying. Yeah, exactly. Probably I mean, true. You're the biggest imposter of them all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Mike, where can people find out more about you? I, I'm pretty sure we've dropped your uh, website into the chat, but um, that's it. I don't do this. Is the first, this is the first and last interview of, of, <laughs> I'll do. Well, thank this you is, so much for, yeah. for hanging out with us. Well, today. you know, it's important. It's, it's, it's important that uh, people, you know, know what design kickstarts about because it's, uh, it's really important. Fundamentals is, is like, you gotta, you gotta do the fundamentals. Yeah, it's it's the most important thing you can do in our business, and I think once you get those, then you know, it, the doors open up. I mean, it really does. So, well, so anyway, so yeah, so I go through it myself. 
So it took, yeah, it took, took 30 years to do an interview, but I'm glad that I finally did. And um, <laughs> because too. this course took three, the, the course took three years to make. I mean, it was just uh, poor Amy. Uh, she had to suffer through me for, I think, two years. <laughs> and then Ryan, you know, he suffered a little bit. And, you know, and yeah, it, it's it's just an awesome, um, it's going to be an awesome course. And, uh, yeah. but yeah, take all the other courses too. Yeah, well, I'm really excited for everyone to uh, start learning from from all of your years of experience. Um, and EJ, uh, I still know next to nothing about um, uh, you know Cinema 4D, but one of these days I'm going to dive know. into those two and be amazed by yeah. <laughs> all of your amazing stuff too. Exactly. <sighs> all right, folks, uh, all I'm right. going to wrap this up. So, um, how about everyone wave goodbye? Uh, everyone in the chat, thank you so much for watching. Thanks thank for you. Thanks for out with us today. And uh, I'll see all of you next week with our international alumni panel. So, bye.